Hello and welcome. And I'm going to start out by saying this is the first time I've ever been filmed. So I'm already kind of freaked out about the fact that I'm being filmed today. Um, my day job, I'm a fourth grade teacher. So whenever I give presentations, I usually like to have people ask questions in the middle while you still remember what your question is instead of saving it to the end. Because if you're nine, you're not going to remember 45 minutes later what your question was. So feel free, I'll try and repeat the question so that the video will hear what the question is so they'll get the question as well as my answer. Um, so you've already had a little bit of an introduction to why I'm up here in the first place and it's because I inherited a huge amount of letters from my grandparents. Uh, when I was growing up, I was always told whenever I went to visit my grandparents that my grandfather served in the Navy, he did his duty, um, and then my grandmother was left home alone with my two uncles and my father was born while my grandfather was serving in the Pacific. And then the rest of that story was, and we wrote to each other every single day. So, ooh, oh no. <laughs> Kind of. Okay, back in business. All right, so I grew up knowing that they wrote to each other every day, and I also grew up knowing that those letters still existed, which for most World War II veterans, typically only 50% of the letters exist, and that's the letters from the soldier home to the wife or the sweetheart or the family members because the typical soldier didn't have the space to carry around letters from home. Maybe they'd keep one or two close to their heart and then they'd eventually get rid of them because they just couldn't carry them in their pack. My grandfather was an officer, so he had a big trunk and he was stationed at, he wasn't, he was a naval doctor, so he actually wasn't even on a ship. He was on a base for most of his experience. So he had space to store those letters. So he saved all the letters um, once he was shipped out. And then my grandmother saved all the letters on her end as well. So when they finally came back together at the end of the war, and after I transcribed all of them, there were over 1,300. So my grandparents didn't really care after they got home about having all those letters and keeping them. So they were thrown in a box and they were stored in a closet for years and years and years. And my father grew up and went away to college and he came home one weekend and my grandmother was in a cleaning frenzy and the box was sitting there in the closet and she told my dad to take them out and throw them in the dumpster. And he said, no, 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 no. So he took them back to school with him or his apartment and then he kept them for the next 20 years. 30 years until I became a budding genealogist in my 20s and because I had the family stories about they wrote to each other every day and I knew the letters were somewhere uh, when it got to the point where I was in my genealogy research where I wanted the letters because how much family history is in those letters a lot um, I kept bugging my dad. I'm like, give me the letters. I want the letters because I knew that he had them at this point. So he shipped them all up and put them in a box and then I put them in a closet for 10 years. <laughs> 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 and I finally really got to the point in my research where, you know what, I need to look through these letters. I need to be systematic about them and I need to take all the information out of them. And over the years, you know, I, my great-grandmother lived with my grandmother for part of the war, and, but she died like halfway through. So I was like, okay, there's gotta be letters with my grandmother telling my grandfather that she died. And so, you know, I dig through and try and find the individual letters, but I really lost the bigger picture. I didn't find the information of, well, I found the letter right after she died, but I didn't get the information leading up to her death. And I had her death certificate, and I knew that she died of pancreatic cancer, but you just don't suddenly die of pancreatic cancer. There's a workup to it. 
So that was one of my impetuses to, I need to really start at the beginning and figure out what happened. And in the process of that, I also discovered that the family archive of photographs that I had been given once my father started cleaning out the house is that those photographs started fitting in with the letters. So the project became much more encompassing because I had all this other memorabilia that started to make sense once they were in the context of the letters. And then I was able to go off and find newspaper clippings and all these other sources and resources that are out there that started to make sense. You know, everything from, well, my family appears on the 1940 census in the town that they were living in, but you know what, they're not living in the house that they were living in during World War II. So all those pieces started to come together as I started to process the archive. All right, so this, these are some beautiful pictures of some of the mess that I have in my house. Um, so when my dad sent me the letters, this is all the letters before I started unwrapping them. So that's a fairly good sized box. It was about you know this big by this big, and you know one of those six inch deep ones. So that's what a thousand letters looks like. Um, I think there's also a. I have my great grandmother's uh, diary or her Bible that she had notes written on the pages, and I also ended up with my great uncle's Bible that he carried with him during World War II. And it also became a valuable tool because he wrote a running diary in the Bible because he was also shipped out and served in the Navy. So that was my grandmother's brother. So both her brother and her husband were shipped out at the same time. Um, so many of us are stuck with, let me see my pointer, stacks like this. And then unfortunately I have to say that I took this picture a year and a half ago and that's still what it looks like, mostly. <laughs> um, but, you know, at, a couple years ago, I, my father lived in a really small apartment in New York City, and so my grandmother had Alzheimer's, so he was the youngest son. He was responsible for helping her clean out the house and putting her into a nursing home, so it was a good thing that I was already on the radar of save everything genealogical for me. So. He rescued a lot of my grandparents' photos and correspondence and other documents that would have had any value to me. And uh, on a trip to New York, he was cleaning out his apartment and he said, okay, we have to get rid of all the, the photographs because we don't have room for them anymore, so they're going to you. So I spent part of my vacation packing everything into these priority mailboxes so they could get to me and sit in my office and just glare at me. All right. All right, so we look at boxes and archives and we think, wow, look at all this great stuff. But it becomes very overwhelming. You know, and I readily admit, I have a lot of stuff that's going to end up in my children's hands. And I want to get it organized in a fashion before I pass it on to them. Or do they really want it? And should I burden them with this? <laughs> because they don't necessarily share my love of family history at this point. My son, uh, my son is 10 and my daughter is 16. And I get varying degrees of interest depending on what story I'm boring them with. Um, but I am exposing them to it, so you know, maybe in another 10 years they might be interested in some of it. All right, so the biggest thing that you wanna do when you have a huge project is you wanna set a goal. Instead of staring at this huge pile that is very overwhelming, break it down into smaller chunks. And this is one of those, you know, business model, like set goals. Um, you want to be specific. What do you want to do with it? It's like asking a genealogical research question. Well, I have an archive. What do I want to do with it? Do I want to save it? Do I want to look at it? Do I want to pass it on to someone else? So it's very important to set a goal. Um, and 
An important part of setting a goal is to make sure that every, other people know what your goal is. If you keep the goal close, one, you're not going to have that support system to prod you on and keep you going. Because how many of you have a project that you start and then it kind of peters away? <laughs> I get very energetic about parts of my project, but you know, after a month or two, I'm bored. I kind of I have other stuff to do. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, so setting a personal goal and letting other people, maybe someone's willing to help you. Maybe you have a grandkid that um, you can rope into helping you. For me. I started my blog in 2012, and I really wasn't thinking about the archive, but it very quickly dawned on me that, hey, you know what? I'll be one of those people that takes one of these letters every day, and I'm going to post it on my blog. And I can say at this point, I just passed my five-year anniversary on my blog. I have posted something from my archive every single day for the last five years. So that's over you know, 2,000 posts. I forget what the exact number is, but the vast majority of my posts have been transcribed letters. And once I finished with the World War II letters, I had letters from other time periods within the family. So once my, fa once my father moved away to college, a correspondence began between my father and his mother. So I have a bunch of letters from when my father was in college, but and then when he grew up <laughs> and got a job, he still continued to correspond. So the letters aren't as frequent, but I am now into the 1970s with correspondence, and my father has given me permission to post excerpts from his diary because he also started writing a diary. So I have a beyond vast collection of family um, heirlooms and history at this point that I want to share and get out there. And it's not necessarily for close family. There's a lot of social history that is found in things like letters and diaries. Um, it's been great in the diary to see his comments about the presidential elections. Um, when Nixon was president before Watergate, um, some of the stuff with the, the space program because my father was a, a, he's an astronomy nut. So just reading his comments about when all the Apollo missions went off, there were little blurbs about Apollo 13. And you know, I wasn't, I mean, I was alive when Apollo 13 um, went off and had all of its troubles, but I was a toddler. I have no memory of it other than the movie a few years ago. So it's really great having the knowledge from the movie, you know, kind of going in the back of my mind and then reading what his comments were for the actual events. All right. So when you start taking apart the box or, you know, because a lot of us have boxes that just have photographs thrown in them, um, you want to, before you start just taking everything out, you want to analyze and organize what is in that box because sometimes boxes have an order to them. Unfortunately, most of my bo boxes don't have an order because my dad was cleaning out drawers, so he would put things into a box. But there are some circumstances where, you know, Grandma Lois had a shoebox up in her closet, and there were, you know, photographs and letters that she had saved for a specific purpose. And so there might be an order to the madness in the box that you want to keep in mind. And um, one of the bloggers, uh, Denise Lavernick, um, she talks a lot about you want to be very systematic about when you unpack that box, put um, photos that appear to be family groups. You want to try and keep them together. Um, I do have boxes from the other side of my family that I know came from my maternal grandmother versus my uh, maternal turtle grandfather and so I know to keep those piles separate while I'm still working through them because I have several photographs from the Civil War that I'm not sure who's in those photographs but I want to make sure that I know or remember which branch of the family they came from
because as I do my research, it might help me further on knowing which branch it came from, I might discover who that person is. Um, for example, I have a photograph of a woman from about 1864-65 and it was put in a specific box and I've, I think I've determined that she was probably my great-great-grandmother on her wedding day because I only have one other picture of her and it was a year or two before she died. So when I put the two pictures next to each other, I think, mm, is it the same woman? I don't know. But because that picture was in the box from that side of the family with that grouping, that leads me to believe that it's more likely to be her because of the time period. So it, excuse me, it's important to try and keep your piles together instead of just mixing everything together. Um, so, yeah. Have you ever posted anything on Dead Fred? No, I have not. The question was, have I ever posted anything on Dead Fred? And no, I have not. But good question. Um, there's some great websites out there for doing things like that. Um, so once you analyze what you have in the box, then is the time to start opening things up and to figure out what's in the document that you have. And for me, with the letters, I took a lot of time to research what I was reading. Um, excuse me. So many of the letters were long. I mean, my grandmother would write four or five pages every day. And she would talk about all the things that her friends and neighbors were doing as they interacted with her. So for me, one of the first steps was trying to figure out who her fan club was. And we all know what the fan club is. That's friends, associates, and neighbors, or friends, families, associates, and neighbors. And the letters turned out to be a wealth of information for the fan club. Um, she mentioned her two best friends that lived in her neighborhood quite often. Um, she mentions births because there was a whole bunch of women in her town that were pregnant at the same time as she was. Um, she would mention uh, children that would play with my uncles. She would mention social events that were happening at the church, um, who, and who got married. Um, she would also write about <clears throat> extended family members because uh, my grandparents lived in northern Indiana but they had both come from communities in southern Indiana so whenever it came close to the holidays they would there would be this huge slew of names of all all the extended family members the aunts uncles cousins neighbors that lived near the farms where the other families lived. So I spent a lot of time trying to figure out and identify, okay, well, if they talk about Mary three more times, maybe she'll give me a last name and I can figure out who this Mary is. And a lot of times it, it actually came to fruition that I was able to figure out who the person was. Um, and actually in my book, If you take a look at it, there's the library copies in the back. There is a mini uh, biography section. So I listed the name of every person that appears in a letter with their dates, um, their spouses, their children, and, and their occupation, what their role was in the community. Did you have to get permission from everybody? Or well, I didn't get permission from anybody. Um, except my father, because he's pretty much the only one that's alive. <laughs> um, and he gave me the letters, he gave me full permission to use them in any way that I wanted. Um, but both my uncles are deceased, my grandparents have been deceased. Um, the vast majority of adults that knew my grandparents are also deceased. So there's a very small select group of children that were briefly mentioned in the the, the letters who are contemporaries of my father. And at this point, um, I've only received positive feedback. <laughs> exactly, so um, yeah, and that's kind of one of my cousin baits is the letters are out there or the, the fan club like bait. Um, every now and then I'll get someone emails me and say, hey, that's my grandfather that you were talking about. And then we have a nice little conversation and it's great and I would say, I don't think I've had a, a single negative comment from anyone saying, how dare you put this information out there. So for me, it's been overwhelmingly positive. 
Um, okay, so once you get past the investigate stage, you need to figure out how am I going to preserve this? And what are the best methods for preserving? All right, so my first step is I wanna transcribe the letters because my grandfather had chicken scratch. He was a doctor <laughs> and he had a doctor's handwriting, but I became really good at reading it just because I had lots of practice reading it day after day after day. Um, so you, you get to learn the patterns in the scribble if you keep looking at the same handwriting every day. And there's some letters that I transcribed then I waited like a month or two and I went back and the context also helped me figure out those one or two missing words and also the flow of the letters. He might have mentioned something on Monday and by Friday he talked about it two more times and so I finally knew, oh, that's what that word meant. And so I could go back and I could fix my transcription. Um, and it's so much easier to read the typewritten version. Yeah. yeah. Letters, one of your steps would be to put them in date order? Yes, oh, you know what? I skipped that whole section. <laughs> so one of the things that I did is, um, let me go back. All right, so before I, as I took them out of the box, um, one of my, now this is not necessarily the best way to preserve a letter for long term, but it's a good way for short term. So every single letter came out of the envelope. Um, and one of the things that you want to be aware of when you take letters out of envelopes is you want to make sure you want to make sure that you flatten the letters because um, creases, wherever there's a crease in the letter in the paper, that's a wear point and that's where you're most likely to tear or um, it, they'll rub away and so those are the most fragile points so by making everything flat it helps preserve it and a lot of times and depending on the paper um, the paper can um, basically eat itself I know there's like a technical term for it yes did you keep the envelopes also yes and those are very crucial for constructing my timeline because um, a lot of times especially in the beginning of the war whenever my grandfather was traveling um, if he was being moved from one base and it was a, a coded operation, he wouldn't necessarily date the letters, but the postmarks would give him away. So the postmarks in some situations helped put the letter in the correct order. Yes? Excuse me. Uh, with envelopes, uh, I have a collection of World War II uh, letters. Uh, and I have a collection of World War II letters. What date should you use? The date of the letter? Or the date of the postmark, or it could be Right. I always go by the, the date that's on the letter. Although I have had a couple of situations where my grandfather lost track of what day it was and he put the wrong date on the letter. And once I put them in order, uh, you know, it's like, okay, he dated that the 9th, but he's talking about stuff that must have happened on the 7th. So you really have to analyze all the clues that the postmark and the context of the letter and the date are telling you. Um, but I would always go with the date that's on the letter. And in the situation um, during World War II, many of the letters had to be censored. And so my grandfather actually talked about that process. He'd write the letter. He wasn't allowed to seal it. He had to turn it over to a fellow officer. And then that would take at least 24 to 48 hours. And then it would go out in the mailbags. So he might have written the letter on Monday, but it didn't leave the base till Wednesday. So th that's where you would see the difference between the postmark and the date of the letter. Um, okay, so back. All right, so I would, I always put them in a plastic sleeve, um, especially in the transcribing stage, because I'm not touching the letter, I'm touching the plastic sleeve. Um, some of the letters do, have multiple pages so I would have to take them out but it does cut down a lot on the wear and tear on the letters with the oil in our hands. I'm not a big white glove person I just make sure that my hands are clean when I touch them and I limit how many times I take them in and out of the sleeve and then they go back in the sleeve. Yes? Do you ever put um, if, if the page is written on just one side do you ever put it back 
back to back in the same state? Um, in no, because the system that I use, I very much do like single days. Um, I do sometimes like when I run out of plastic sleeves to conserve space, I'll put two in there. But overall, I try and do one day, one sleeve. Because then later on, when I move them into the Hollinger boxes, I typically have a folder with one letter or all the letters for a certain date. And then the next folder is all that. But again, that's personal preference. And I'm very big on personal preference <laughs> for this. What's the best way to preserve um, pencil letters? Because um, it's fading? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Um, the question is, how do we preserve um, pencil written documents if the pencil is fading? Um, some of the links that I have on the handout have some really good best practices, and you should be able to find specific answers to those questions. Yes? I have a suggestion of like, putting that you might uh, copy some pages. That was where I was going next, which is the scanning. Um, how many of you have scanned as a JPEG? Okay. That's the wrong kind of file that you should be scanning. Anyone scanned as a PNG? Okay, also really bad. <laughs> a GIF? Okay, also really bad. A bitmap? Okay. All these file types were developed for easy access to share documents online. They're not preservation formats. What you should be pervert <laughs> is the good old TIFF. Um, the difference between a TIFF and all these other types is a TIFF is a, a lossless file versus all the others are lossy, especially that JPEG. A lossy file will degrade over time, and every time you make an adjustment to it, it loses part of its um, integrity. Yes? If you've done it to a JPEG, can you move it to a TIFF? You, uh, the question was, if you've done it as a JPEG, can you move it to a TIFF? Yes, but it will not improve the quality. You are stuck at the quality level that you scanned the JPEG. I do have some things where I, I, you know, there were files that I received from other distant family members, so they sent me a scan. And so I've gone through and tried to convert them, but they're kind of stuck at a lower level quality. Before I forget. That's okay. <laughs> um, to her question, I've done some laminating of some old. How do you feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's another one of those evils. It's an evil. Yeah, and I, there's, um, on the handout, I think there's an article that I, or one of them talks about it. And there are archival museums, uh, uh, organizations out there that do do laminating, but it's a much higher level laminating than we as home consumers could even do because they do high level cleaning of the document because once we laminate it, we're locking the dirt and any germs and chemicals, we're trapping them in there. We're also not allowing the document to breathe. And so, yeah, my grandmother was notorious. She wrapped things in saran wrap. <laughs> so I have a lot of documents that I've had to like peel the saran wrap off of, but at least it's not like permanently glued on. Um, I have my great-great-grandfather's naturalization papers from the 1860s, the original document with the wax seal on it, and I had to extricate it from the saran wrap. <laughs> um, yeah, so I do not recommend the laminating either. Well, the old um, photo albums, like from the 70s and everything, how do you take the pictures that are from the um, there's, a, there's several different techniques. Um, I don't, I've heard one, and I'm not sure if it's a good, where people actually took like um, dental floss to help like peel the picture off, but I'm, I'm not sure at this point if that's a good practice or a bad practice. I've read about it, 
But there's lots, there are lots of techniques out there for if you have those older albums, um, trying to get them out. Because you really should try and get them off those like sticky pages. Yes? Yeah, I don't have a flip pal, and one of the reasons that I haven't purchased a flip pal is I am not sure if it does scan as a TIFF file. Well, you can still scan as a JPEG and make your first move to the TIFF, so right. you're not having further degradation every time you do something. Right. Like, oh, that's true. Yeah, because um, like right now, my father is scanning his diary pages for me, and some of the apps change that he's using to scan, and so it's scanning everything as. Um, it's getting everything as a TIFF. I got him to stop doing PDFs, um, but with the app that he's doing now, sorry, Dad, <laughs> um, he, um, it was scanning all the TIFFs together, so I had to get a special file that separated all the TIFFs so I could look at them as individual files. So there are technology programs out there that will help you eventually get what you want, but sometimes it takes several steps to get to that TIFF file. All right. All right, another thing that you need to take into consideration when you're doing your scanning is the DPI versus the PPI. And most of us just think of DPI, that's when you print a picture. So that's the dots per inch. So when you're actually printing out a picture that you scanned, um, that's with the DPI. The PPI is the pixels. So when you're scanning, you really want to be concerned about what is the pixel count for what the object that you're scanning. Um, the minimum that I would recommend for a photograph is 300. Uh, most of the time I scan at 600 at this point. So when I began with the World War II letters, uh, my initial letters were scanned at 300, but now I'm scanning everything at 600. So someday I might have to go back and rescan the early letters. Um, you can scan some things all the way up to 1200, um, especially when you have small pictures and you want to be able to make it larger. Um, if you increase the PPI amount, so if you have a small picture and you scan it at 300, when you look at the image, it will stay that same dimension size. But if you want to retain the quality and be able to blow it up without it becoming all pixelated, that's when you want to increase your PPI to a higher amount. However, just increasing the PPI amount does not make your image quality better in the end because you are still stuck with your original document. So if you have a printed photograph from the 1940s, um, the print quality is going to fight against you at some point because you can only scan the, the, the sorry, I lost my thought there. Um, you can only, you can't make the original thing better. You can only make it as good as it was. Um, and a lot of the early printing techniques are not as good as they are today. Um, okay, so once you've scanned everything onto your computer, you need to organize it. And my method of saving files may not work for you. This is the method that works best for me. I am manic about putting everything in chronological order. So if I can establish a date, I put that exact date on the file. And for me, it works really well because my grandmother was also a fanatic about dating everything. So whenever she took a photograph of the children to send to my grandfather, she would write the names of the three boys at the bottom of the picture, like he wouldn't know who his only <laughs> sons were, um, and he would put their age, and sometimes she would actually write the exact date. If she didn't write the exact date, she put a range close enough that as I was reading the letters, I could figure out exactly which day she took the letters. because. Cameras and film were so much more precious than they are now. Um, at some points during the war, she really had to conserve how many photographs she was taking because the scarcity of film 
was, became more of a problem as the war progressed. Um, so th there's some, I think there's one letter where she talks about um, her sister-in-law's sister worked at one of the factories, the film um, companies nearby, and so she got her an extra couple rows of film because it, it, they were, film was rationed just like everything else. Um, so on my computer, I have folders that are organized by year, broken down, and then within each um, year, depending on what it is, these are the letters. I have them organized by day. I also, and I always start with the year in my title, um, then the month, then the day, because when you tell it to sort by name, it will automatically put it in chronological order. I know a lot of people out there like to put their files with the family groups. That doesn't work for me and my OCD habit of having to have it in chronological order. Um, and then I also um, habitually, I make an abbreviation of who wrote the letter, especially with my grandparents writing every day. And sometimes my grandfather wrote twice a day. So, and the only reason I, I the only way I could differentiate which letter was written first is sometimes there was a morning mail and an evening mail, so the postmarks on the letters would help me, and sometimes he would say in the second letter, well, I wrote earlier today, but I wanted to get this out too. So some, on some days, he actually wrote two letters. And so here's a good example. I don't know if you can see it, but I wrote the AM and the PM letter, so I could tell and A comes before P alphabetically, so <laughs> that goes with my time order. Um, also, every now and then, and I, I put the three initials for the person, so RSY is my grandfather, and GRY is my grandmother, and then JLF is my great uncle, because there's a couple letters from him that came in the mix. And every now and then I would get a random letter from another family member that was saved in there. So I would put the initials of that person in. And again, whatever system works best for you, use it and be consistent. And it will help you in the long run if you know what your system is and you use it well. You'll be able to find a letter whenever you want to look for it. So for me, with my dates, if I'm going through something else, if I find a document and it's, it has a date on it or an approximation of time, and I think, oh, you know what, I think there was a reference to this, I can quickly go back and I can find the letter and find my collaboration or my corroboration between the two documents. <clears throat> then within each folder, I put everything related to that document in the same folder so I can find it. So I have, you'll notice there's doubles of everything here. The one on the left has a watermark on it. This is my JPEG file. My preservation copy is the TIFF file because with my blog, it won't allow me to post a TIFF um, file because it takes way too much um, um, megabytes. The size of the file is too large and uh, my blog company doesn't or discourages the use of those TIFF files. And like I said earlier, JPEG was developed for online use. So what I do is I scan everything as the TIFF and then I convert it to the JPEG instead of going from the JPEG to the TIFF. I go the other direction and I always put a watermark on it. Does there, does everyone know what a watermark is? Um, most photo programs and even uh, Microsoft Word will allow you to write something on But now I watermark everything, one, so I can keep track of my images out there in case it ends up on somebody else's web website in the long term. Plus, it's also a little beacon out there. So if somebody finds it and then copies it and puts it somewhere else, I don't lose that cousin bait opportunity because if someone else takes it and appropriates it as their own, 
then I'm kind of cut out of that, but hey, it's my document, I want people to contact me. So by putting, I put my website on everything. So if someone finds it out there, they can go to my website, they can find all my contact information. Yes? Why do I do each page separately? Um, because I like to be able to manipulate each page separately if I have to. Um, if you scan a, um, an image file, you, you can't really manipulate them if you scan them all in a bunch. You can't really separate them. And the, whatever was uh, scanned first becomes the primary document and you can't really access or amend anything further on. Um, so, and I'm not a big PDF person when it comes to documents. I know a lot of people do do that, but I am much more of, I like to be able to manipulate a image file versus a PDF, which is a more text-based file. Yes? You have, I understand like the uh, tip and the JPEG, and then the Word file at the end. Yes, that's my transcription. So I put the transcription to that letter in the same file so that I can find it later. It's also, it also lets me know that yes, I already, trans, I already transcribed this letter. Yes? Back to the watermark. Yes. If somebody prints a picture mm -hmm. and you get the hint that there may be a picture, doesn't that give you a link to somebody that's within your family group? I've I, I recently ran into that and was able to acquire it. Not, not, I would say 50% of the time, no. What would they, why would they have your picture? What would they be doing? Because um, there are people out there that just collect people versus actually doing research. They collect people? Right, they just have huge databases and they just put, they dump anything on anyone that's even remotely related and they not, don't necessarily have any interest mm -hmm. in pursuing research on that line. Good question. <laughs> but yes, I have found my pictures in files of people that, you know, it's a third cousin twice removed in law. And I'm like, why, do you, why did you take my picture? <laughs> but anyway, yes, Claire. I kind of want to move on. <laughs> I don't want to um, dwell too much on bad practices at the moment. All right, so within, this is another way that, so I, if I go back. All right, so this was specifically the letters by year and day. This is a bigger part of my archive, and this is more than just letters. This is all the photographs and everything that I'm integrating into my archive. I have a, an external hard drive where I save my main, I call it my archive because everything that I've scanned and collected goes into that archive and everything is organized. All right, so once you've scanned a picture, there are some elements in the scanning programs that let you tag and write metadata so that you can um, keep the information with the photograph. Um, because if you don't have a long lengthy title of your photograph, for example, I could say Gladys with Mark and David in 1942. It's a very long and lengthy title. Um, this photograph I did, I, I know you probably can't see this, but I did put, I coded it with the thirst, first three letters of the surname group that I'm working on, the year, and then the, the, the year, the month, and then like a little bit of a description. Um, but further on in the metadata section, 
you can tag people in the photograph so that when you're searching on your computer, it will bring up every picture that has that person in it. So you can look through those pictures more quickly. Um, and you can write other notes too. In the comment box, you can um, write if you received the image from another person, another relative. You know, Aunt Mary gave me the original of this picture, or you know, Uncle Silas gave me a digital scan of the photograph. So you can keep a provenance with the photographs, so that when you go back to them at a later date, you will be looking at them, going, "When did I? Which? Oh, who? Which cousin sent me that email with this photograph?" If you save it, the file from the email, then you'll know exactly where it was if the two get separated. And I also like to, if my grandmother wrote notes on the back, the comments in the metadata section of the file allows you to copy the notes. Um, sometimes I do scan the back of the picture so I can see the handwriting as well and I try and save them, the two files, so they stay together. Or I name them in such a way that they stay together. Beth, did you have a question? Um, when you go, when you click on file and it gives you, you know, the general, if you go under details, um, you can put a title, a subject, a rating, and then it says tags. So you can create your tags and I think they're separated by a semicolon. So you could tag as many people as you wanted. I haven't tried, like, I, I usually tag maybe four or five people per photograph. So I haven't really tried to do like 25, but. And then, of course, down at the bottom, it will give you the, your information of the, the scan size, the dimensions, and how many pixels, and what your, your PPI was when you scanned it. Yeah. This was taken in the front door of uh, my grandparents' house in Indiana, and this was fairly soon after my father came home from the hospital, after he was born. All right. So there's some great preservation supplies out there, and I am so mad at myself. I was grabbing something to bring and show you, and I left that at home, but I have some. So I talked a little bit earlier about Hollinger boxes. Um, these are archival quality boxes that museums and libraries use. Um, they're reinforced around the edges with metal. Um, the cardboard that the boxes are made of are a special paper, uh, they're non-acidic, so they won't, if they touch the paper or the documents, the chemicals from the box will not interact with the chemicals of the paper and cause degradation that way. Um, oh. I've also purchased heavy quality from the same company, Hollinger's, the company that makes the boxes. Um, the website is on the handout. They also make heavy quality file folders that you can use in the boxes. And if you get really organized, they also have acid-free labels that you can put on the folders. And they have uh, acid-free pens that you can write um, on the labels. <laughs> so. Lots of preservation that way. Another thing that I use are these, because most of my pictures did not come in photo albums, they came in piles and boxes, shoe boxes just filled. Um, I use a lot of these sleeves. I forgot my smaller bag. I have a bag that fits like three by seven photographs, which is the vast majority of my photographs. So you can put the item inside, it makes it so that you can see both sides of the photograph. Um, it has a flap that folds down with a sticky that is away from where the photo comes in and out. So if you're trying to take it out, you won't accidentally get it on the sticky part. Um, and I like them just for the convenience of, I have nice boxes now that I can just quickly go through the photographs and pull out the one that I want because they're not in a photo album, they're just organized. Um, and I have a internal organization system where if they're just in the box freehand, I don't automatically put them in the sleeve. 
if they're in a free box, if I take it out of the free box, I scan it and then it goes in the sleeve. So if I have a photograph in my collection that's in a sleeve, that's my clue to myself that I've already scanned it. So if I'm having trouble on my computer figuring out where I put the photograph, the sleeve gives me the clue that, oh, you had to have scanned it at some point. So for me, that's like a, my filing system didn't quite work for me, but I have other clues that, that help me along. I also have a vast collection of slides. So I keep them in, this is another comp, actually, this is another company, but this is print file. Um, no, it is the same company, but each slide goes in a packet. So it's another way that I can, you know, look at the light, see what's in the slide. It minimizes the plastic is acid free so that if it touches the film, it won't damage the film. And you can use an acid free pen to write at the top. And this is also another clue to myself. If it's in here, I've scanned it already. Um, my grandfather, well, my grandparents traveled the world a lot after my grandfather retired and they were both avid photographers. So um, another thing that I inherited in those boxes at the very beginning were hundreds and hundreds of slides of all their trips around the world. And I have to play, okay, find the family photographs mixed in with the world travel photographs. So I, and my grandfather made these wooden boxes that they actually, they're very good at organizing them. So I have little notes of what was supposed to be in every single box and they did a fairly good job labeling them. But over time, as people have gone through the boxes, the order has degraded a little bit, but I love my grandmother's little notes that she put with the, with the slides. All right, another thing that you might want to think about is keeping an inventory of what you have scanned. Um, this is an inventory that I created of the World War II letters. Um, you can use just a regular Excel spreadsheet. Um, for this one, I chose to use uh, Google's version of Excel. It's stored in the cloud and I can access it from any of my devices. I can be at my laptop, I can look at it I've made it so that it's accessible offline on my iPad. So if I ever need to reference it, it's right there. Um, and I've made notes, oops, shoot. I've made notes of who wrote the letter, where the letter was written, um, who received the letter, where the receiver was located, the date of the letter, and in this case, I also included the postmark from the envelope. And in some cases, um, the envelopes were missing. So I only had data for when the writer of the letter wrote the letter, not when my grandmother necessarily received it. I also made notes about how many pages were in the letter and whether an envelope was included. So this is an inventory for me. Um, because I've started the transition for some of the letters. I've moved them out of the binders into the Hollinger boxes. So in the Hollinger boxes, they're all saved in folders. And so the folders are labeled on the top. So if I'm looking for a specific letter, then I can go and pull the file quickly and easily. So you have yes. one letter per what I ended up doing, because each Hollander box only holds about 50 folders once they're full, is I have all the letters in the folder. So if there was a letter from my grandfather and my grandmother on the same day, then they both go in the same letter. Yes? So far I'm not seeing that you're reducing volume. Not really. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't recommend destroying any original document. You always want to, I mean, it's fine to scan it, and that definitely reduces it, but the question is what do you do it with it once 
you've scanned it and you have your digital copy of it. All right, so moving on to share or not to share. Um, so are you one of those people that holds on to everything in your archive and you don't want to share it with anyone else? Because I'm sure we've come across some people out there in the genealogy world that think they have ownership of all the information and they don't want to share with anyone. Um, so it's up to you which, what you want to share and, and there are some good reasons for not sharing. There are obviously privacy issues. Um, there might be family members who, might, who are embarrassed or you know, the contents of the letters. I definitely, for me, I have a bit of a conundrum coming up in my own archival journey to post on my blog. Um, I met 1971 in my father's diaries at this point. My parents were divorced in 1976. And part of me is really dreading the point when I get to 1975 because I know it's not going to be pretty. And I have to weigh my wanting to get the information out there with protecting the privacy and feelings of people that are in the documents and the letters. So you really, you also need to think about that. Also, you also, um, sorry, um, most of governmental papers, they're sealed for a certain amount of time. Um, the censuses don't, we're, we only have up to 1940 release. 1950 has a, we have a few more years and it's because um, they want to give um, privacy and respect people that might not necessarily want that information out there. You know, there's a lot of unscrupulous people out there that would use that information against us. Um, so you really want to think about, well, do I really want to talk about, you know, someone who was born in 1980, you know, that you know a distant cousin if they're, if they're in a document do you really think they want all their information out there without asking them so if you do come across a younger person in a in a letter or a document you might want to contact them first and find out if they're okay with that because i have a full range of relatives that you know some of them oh go ahead that's awesome that they're out there and then some of them are uh, I'm not sure I want that out there. And it's the same for DNA too, because I have some relatives that are, are totally interested in you know, having their DNA tested, but I've asked other older relatives or, and they're not interested at all. And ultimately you have to respect their wishes. All right. So some of the ways that you can share information out there is through blogging. Um, I use the website uh, by WordPress. And I have a friend, Amanda, who let me use a clip from her website, um, Amanda's Athenaeum, um, and she uses Blogger. Blogger is through uh, Google. It's one of its sub-companies. Um, and they have different formats. Both the basic blogs are free. You can upgrade with WordPress to add more um, features. Um, storage. I pay for extra storage. I also pay for my domain name so that it's not just this huge long string. Um, so I have a specific, yes? I don't mean to be disrespectful okay. when I ask this, but why do, why do you blog? Why do I blog? Um, I blog because I have this vast archive and I wanted to get it out there. So, and I also like the cousin bait concept. And that's why a lot of bloggers are out there. Um, I know a lot of bloggers that do, like uh, Amanda was doing this 52 ancestors. So each week she'd take an ancestor from her family and she'd write a little biography out there. And it's a good way if someone's just doing a Google search and the name comes up, it's a good way for cousins to find you. Um, so maybe someone who's not necessarily on ancestry um, would find your, the information you've posted on a blog. That, um, I've, had, I've had a couple of people, um, not related to me, but their ancestor was from my grandparents' hometown, like their grandfather, and uh, they either served in the Navy, and there were you know, little tidbits about their grandfather, and you know, it, it's been a very positive experience. 
that way for me to blog. It's also a good way having it publicly accessible if I come across someone and as a way of introducing myself and kind of giving myself a little street cred. I'm like, hey, if you want to know more about me, go check out my blog. And then they have the, the option of going and learning more about me instead of just this inquisitive stranger that wants to know information about their family. <laughs> Um, there are some other options out there if you want to be a little more private. Um, you, like Shutterfly, Peekaboo, Snapfish, they're all companies that you can print books. Um, and they are primarily uh, photo books. So I've used some of these for family vacations where this was a great freebie. It was a hardcover version. And they have templates online where you can collate, and it's the modern version of the photo album. So they'll print fairly high quality copies of your photographs. And so we, had a, we actually had a professional photo shoot on this field trip or this vacation. And so, you know, so now my kids have a copy of this because, you know, when they were younger, I did all that scrapbooking, but I don't have time for that now. <laughs> So the photo, these photo albums, they still take a little time, but not as much as some of the, the scrapbooking stuff that's out there. And there are lots of great templates that you can use now. All right. And, and then last year for Christmas or the year before, I, you know, for the grandparents, I made kind of baby books for each of my kids. Um, you know, just kind of collated a year of you know, photographs. Yeah, so there's lots of great things that you can do with the photo books online. And they're reasonably, reasonably inexpensive and they're always sending me coupons to reduce the price. Um, um, if you wanna get a little more energetic, like I have done, um, there's a couple of websites out there that will help you publish a book and our library even has its own printing press as well. So that, is it iBook, iPress? Okay, so the iStreet Press. Um, with Create Space, that's the company that I use. It has a agreement with Amazon. So you set the book up, you do all the formatting with Word, you upload the file and Create Space will print the book for you and put it on sale for Amazon. So most people might not be comfortable with selling their family history on Amazon. So there are some other options with Lulu and Blurb. They'll do limited printing and definitely the iStreet Press. You can do limited printing. Um, the great thing about CreateSpace for me, it's print on demand. I don't have to shell out about a bunch of money. Um, in the old days, if you wanted to print a family history, you had to give a printer, you know, 500 or a thousand dollars and you had to buy all the copies of the book and you would hope that your relatives would buy them and <laughs> you'd get your money back. With the, the system, the model that's out there now, you only have to buy one copy of the book. They take a cut out of it for their printing costs. Um, so um, it can be a, an inexpensive way to get information, um, family history out there to share. Yes? Yeah, I would suggest that you go to Higginson, which is in Salem, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And they want, they, they want a camera ready copy, whatever size you use, I use different size. And they'll print the whole thing for you. Right. And they sell them individually as somebody writes to me and say, I want to know about this, and I refer to them. I don't have to bother them. Hey, yes. The I have a bunch of books from, from that company. It, was it Higgins? Higginson. Higginson, yes. Um, that was a, an older model for a while there. They, if it was an out of print, you know, before 1922 copyrighted book and it was in their catalog, they would print this beautiful hardcover copy of the book. And I bought quite a few of those. Um, but they've now moved into the, the, the author print system as well. Um, then I want everyone to think about who is going to take care of your archive next.
because I can organize to my heart's desire, but someday I'm not going to be there to take care of it anymore. And I don't necessarily know that my children, that's my son down at the bottom, um, has any interest in taking care of mom's vast archive of documents. Um, so I would urge people to come up with a plan of what you want to do with the documents. So kind of to go with the question of Reduce, my plan is I want to scan as much as I possibly can, keep copies for myself, and then as I've collated and put a collection together, you know, for my grandparents, anything that's related to that one set of grandparents, um, I want to donate it to either a university that they were affiliated with in Indiana or possibly the state archives or the state library. But if you're going to do that, you need to contact the institution first, and you need to find out if they're willing to take the collection. It also helps if you have it organized somewhat before you pass it on to them, because most libraries and archives in this time and place don't have the manpower or the funds to organize collections that people just dump on them. So if you want your collection to be available out there for other people to enjoy and scholars to use it, you need to do some of the work now before you pass it on to someone else because it will either get lost or jumped. Uh, along that line, I have two questions. <laughs> sure. One is, uh, when you were showing uh, the slides, did you have in the particular room that you were showing mm -hmm. you know, I noticed, were they on the sheet? Because I have we have thousands of yeah. slides, and I don't know how to protect them so that you know the children can decide in some right. what they want. So were they individual, or did you get a sheet that you could insert them into? It's um, they're little pockets. So the, the slides kind of go into a little pocket so you can take them out individually. And then they sell them in packages of like 50 or 100 of the sleeves at a time. Yes? If you wanted to uh, donate some of the uh, records and photos and whatever, what would be the negative to doing it while you were still alive? Oh, there isn't one. Yeah, <laughs> there isn't one at all. So that would be the, the right. Solution. Yeah, one. The question was, what would be the benefit of waiting till you were gone to donate to a institution? Why couldn't you do it now? There is no. Yeah, um, and actually, it might be better to do it while you're still alive because you could help the institution with organizing it and being able to, you know, relay more information about the collection. Sure. Um, my aunt, um, several years before she died, she kept a daily journal, mm. and my cousin has let me read it, and it's um, it's just a wonderful um, point in time in a small town. But how could she preserve that so that um, it doesn't deteriorate, and so that her grandchildren and so forth? The, same, the Hollander company that has this box for the files, they also have boxes for um, Bibles and smaller journals and books <coughs> of, of the same archival quality um, cardboard, the acid-free. So if you go to the website, you can kind of poke around and see if there are boxes that they would fit in. I would also recommend, you know, definitely donate to an institution. I came across recently and the research for one of my projects. Um, have you heard of Archive Grid? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a subdivision of WorldCat and it catalogs um, world archives. So if you're looking for a specific geographic location, you can put in that geographic location or even sometimes names um, and it will give you a list of institutions around the country that have you know, documents or books. And so 
I put in uh, the county in Indiana that I'm researching and it came up that the Indiana State Archives had an account book for the town where my ancestors lived in. And it was for one year and I contacted the, the archive and they made copies of those pages for, I gave them a list of surnames and they copied every page that had those surnames on. So the diary or the journal you know, could end up in an archive someday where a researcher's looking for someone that was, you know, a surname that was mentioned in that book. Um, I attended a, a workshop one time that said, don't assume that the things that were donated are, are in the original place that they were because sometimes I, my ancestors are from Indiana too, right. and I might donate them to Sac State or something like exactly. that. So. The, w the point she was saying was that don't be limited to where your ancestors lived. And um, so if I have ancestors in Indiana, I might move to California and end up donating my vast collection to an archive here in California, but all the information has to do with something back in Indiana. So make your searches broader and because um, that one account book, there's one year that's in the Indiana State Archives. Somehow it got separated by the rest, with, from the rest of the account books because the rest of the account books are in the Library of Congress. So why this really small, small town in Indiana, um, the account books for this guy that owned a general store in the 19th century ended up in the Library of Congress, I have no clue, but that's on my to-do list if I ever get to the Library of Congress as I want to look through these account books. Yes? Uh, yeah. Uh, letters from World War II, uh, I, 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 I've read a couple of books and I've gotten some real uh, valuable letters. Mm -hmm. They really uh, tie the family emotionally yeah. to, the, uh, to the people in the book. But these families are pretty far removed. They have to keep the letters. Right. They have no interest in those letters. Is there someone um, I would, if you, do you know where the letters were written, like, like where the recipient lived? This letter was written by a, a, a fellow that served in the Italian campaign of World War II. He okay. Was in action. Oh, okay. So, so that <laughs> the Million Letters Project would be a great. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the, the other group that you started to mention. Um, the Ac Center for American War Letters. Right. All that information is on this flyer. So um, it will give you information about letters no dealing with uh, any of the war correspondence. And one of the things I did forget to mention uh, when this gentleman made the presentation, he said it just doesn't have to be the person who served in the military. It can be like Donna Dolly. You know, oh, yeah. one of your relatives was a donut dolly. Any, anything that dealt with people in the wars. Right. What's a donut dolly? During, <laughs> during World War I, especially because Gina Philibert Ortega talked about this in her presentation last summer. Um, or No, it was, it was a presentation she did at Jamboree because the theme was World War I. There were these women that served on the front and they would make donuts every day and then they would go out and serve them to the soldiers. Kind of like the precursor to the USO. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to pursue one more thing on the sure. World War II letters. Well, I read this book, the family told me about the new one, but it's been so many years they, they thought somebody had them and then somebody else had them. And right. Somebody else had them. And <laughs> I basically gave up. What? No, we didn't back up. They gave up. And right. I would say, no, if, if, if somebody's seen the letter and moved around, they're probably still somewhere else. And they always tell me, well, we looked and looked and we couldn't find them. And like nine days later, they didn't get back up. Here's a letter. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't let it move just because somebody says no. Exactly. Uh, let me, I think I'm almost done. Okay. So, <laughs> question. Right. Um, I've been in there a couple times, I've looked at their material, they don't have a lot of reservation stuff. I thought right. the prices seemed pretty high, but 
Yeah, I would be. I would be careful just buying a, a container without checking to make sure that it says like archival safe. Um, also, I didn't really talk about it um, because we're not big in California with basements and attics, um, but paper doesn't like plastic and water. So, <laughs> and you hear the horror stories of people that you know had a plastic bucket of letters down in a basement and it flooded because the water heater broke. And at the first stage, the plastic bucket might protect the letters, but then the mold and the mildew get trapped in there and that's not good for the letters either. Yeah, so, they have a specific yeah, awesome. <laughs> Over here. <laughs> Don't throw them away. <laughs> Don't throw them away. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. I would also point out that the Family History Center up on Eastern, they have some really beefy scanners. They don't have a slide scanner yet, because I was talking to the, the brother that was there a month or so ago, but they are hoping to get a slide scanner soon. And yeah. Right. The only caveat that I would say for that is that they're probably scanning them as JPEGs instead of TIFF files. So, yeah. Yes. So while we're on the subject of slides. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> don't throw away slides. However, my question, right. my question is this. If the, the, the majority of the slides, let's say 750 out of 1,000, right. is of scenery. Right. You don't know where it is. Or it's of people's right. backs. <laughs> right. You don't know who it is. Do you really keep all of that? I would be selective. <laughs> like, at some point, you do have to trash some of those junk slides. So, yeah. And um, another archive grid adventure that I went on had um, University of Colorado Denver. I have a family member who was a professor there a hundred years ago, and he was a photographer. So I had a friend who lived in Denver, and I'm like, uh, please go look through the file boxes for me because there was two file boxes. And she took notes. There wasn't much family information. There was a biography that he had written that was in the file. But because um, he was a photographer, uh, there were a lot of photographs that he'd taken of the countryside. But you know, he kind of had a little more clout with the University of Colorado because he'd been a professor there. So it kind of went with his papers as a professor. But you know, it worked out for me because I got some more family information that I didn't previously have. Ah, okay, over here. Yeah, go back to the labeling or titling of, of scanned pictures. You, know, you had your grandmother and uncle and father and that. Right. What do you suggest to do with multi-generational photographs, say at weddings or reunions, where you have lineage on both sides going right. back three, four generations? <laughs> How do you label something like that? Yeah. It's a big label. It's a big <laughs> label. Yeah. Come up with, yeah. I kind of just, I basically do like the four family names. My, my grandparents' four names. So I have the, the Jaeger Leonard, the McGraw, the Leonard, and the, and the Foster. So I break it down on those four lines and anything that appears on those four lines, that's what I scan it under. And then my, my grandmothers, once after they married, they kind of get lumped in with their husband's side. But 
And that's one technique that some people use. Yes? I have a bunch of photographs from my father's time. And it's in the 1800s. And I Just do some searches on Google, because um, you'll find old photographs on eBay. Um, every now and then I'll get, you know, based on my public tree online, someone has found a photograph at a, you know, a flea market or a, an antique mall, and they'll see from my tree that I'm researching that surname. So I'll get an email saying, I have found these photographs with this surname. Are you interested? And usually I tell them no, because it's not mine, but there are people out there that do that as well. Yeah, I don't know. There's so many pictures of people I don't even know. Yeah. They are. Exactly. <laughs> if you know the general geographic location, I would also recommend uh, contacting a genealogical society in that county. I've done that with a, some of the photographs from my grandfather's family because he came from a very small county in Indiana and it still only has like 10,000 people in it so um, I, I gave them copies of the pictures and they have them posted on their website so hopefully kind of through crowdsourcing maybe someone will recognize another person in that photograph. And is it possible that people watch these at any house with a I would, uh, yes. <laughs> Because I would love to be that person that wants your picture and then being able to find it somewhere someday. Even if the name isn't there. <laughs> well, uh, the president of the um, Genealogical Association of Sacramento, she found a picture of her great grandchildren or great great folks that didn't remember. The great grandchildren. Yeah. On, All right, I know Claire, you had your hand up. Yes, could you spell the name of that company? Uh, which one? It's on the handout. The Hollinger? It's on the, 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 the Hollinger company is on the, the handout. Okay. And then the other one with the, the, the plastic is print file. And I probably need to stop talking now. <laughs> one more question. My last question. Okay. So um, I, have, I need a recommendation. I have a, um, what they call the autograph book from my oh, great grandmother back in the 1800s. My mother gave it to me in a plastic bag. It was falling apart when I got it, which I've had for five years now. I don't know what to do with it. Do you, I don't. Do you want to repair it? I don't know if they're, that's what I can't decide. Right. If I want to keep it and repair it, or if I want to donate it, or it would be, yeah. it, it's from Kansas. Okay. So I don't know what to do with it, but I don't right. want it to totally fall apart and disintegrate. Right. I'll talk to you a little bit. I have a, a neighbor who's actually a bookbinder, so. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank well, you. thank you everyone for coming. Thank you.